Thank still you, see us. Um, and Marty, and Don still. Coke uh, for the lovely music today. And uh, Don's Don. When Don is in charge of music, we usually call everyone involved fallen angels. Um, welcome to that special club. And Kathy, thank you for that beautiful reading. Um, your spirit in it, I think, helped me hear it in a, in a much deeper way than when I usually hear those words read. And that song, there's one, one verse we didn't sing, and it's one of my all-time favorite verses to sing anywhere at any time. And it says, for the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, Friends on earth and friends above, for all tender thoughts and mild. Will you please join me in a prayer for illumination? Beloved God, we come to you today among friends here and with hearts full for our friends above. For gratitude, for living in such a beautiful part of your creation. Gratefulness for the warmth of the sun, the light that comes after the storm. We give thanks for one week past and time yet to come, but we give especially thanks just to be here now. We pray that you would help us slow down, to take a Sabbath, to breathe in deeply, exhale freely, to be reminded that you are as near as our very breath, So we pray, God, that you soften our hearts and open our minds. And through this mystery we cannot explain, we pray that the words spoken become the words we need to hear today. As we come together in your presence as sisters and brothers. Amen. So, uh, my sister has a little freckle on her bottom lip. She's had it for over 50 years. It's a little reminder of the day she got into a disagreement with a friend. She was about 10 years old, and she and her friend were walking through the woods, and they came upon a fence. And my sister insisted it was an electric fence, and her friend insisted it wasn't. And so to prove her point, my sister, for reasons never fully understood, to prove her point, she leaned over and she touched the fence with her lip. Well, the good news is she won the argument. <laughs> Even more importantly, she learned a valuable lesson that day. It's not always enjoyable being right. Many of us, especially those who have played the role, uh, some sort of role in the life of a young person, are familiar with the phenomena of being uncomfortably right. There's a sometimes hollow feeling that can accompany being correct. Parenting at times can feel like a long series of slow motion car wrecks. You see exactly what's going on. You warn the child you realize your warning is not being heeded. And then you witness the accident you easily predicted. You were right, but it's cold comfort. Perhaps I'm sensitive to this because when I was 16 years old, every week for four months, I would read and reread a little poem posted on the wall of my driver's ed class. It said, here lies John Jay who died maintaining his right of way. He was right, dead right, as he sped along. 
but he's just as dead as though he'd been dead wrong. <laughs> now, I've actually been known to recite that little ditty at times when I'm the passenger in a, in a car. You know, being right isn't always what it's cracked up to be. Did you ever have a friend who seemed to constantly replace one bad romantic partner with another, usually a carbon copy of the last one, only the name has been changed to protect the guilty? And your friend thinks they're in a brand new situation, and sometimes they say things like, finally I'm in a healthy relationship. And, and, or at least they say, well at least this one is different from my last romantic liaison. But for you, the observer, well, it's like being stuck in that film Groundhog Day, and you just see the exact same scenario, the same relationship being played out again. And you just have to wait and watch for the wreck again. I had a friend who went through a rough patch in his life, like 10 or 15 years long. And I honestly, he was changing girlfriends so regularly that I stopped trying to remember their names. I figured, you know what, at best I'm going to meet her once or twice. So I wouldn't even bother, he'd say, this is Lisa, I'd be like, hey, you know? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to speak the truth. Sometimes it's hard to hear the truth. Both the readings we heard today involve these dynamics. The Apostle Paul must surely know that this wisdom he shared with the church in Corinth, this incredibly poetic praise for the power and importance of love, would be hard to hear. I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And people go gaga over the sound of these beautiful words. Love is patient. Love is kind. If I don't have love, I have nothing. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Well, surely Paul must know that that is really hard to hear. We know it's hard because, well, so many people struggle with it. Struggle with putting love at the center of their interactions with other people. Many of us may dismiss it as a quaint sentiment wonderfully suited for weddings, though we may roll our eyes when we hear it at a wedding because it feels hackneyed and unoriginal. But at least it fits in with other sentiments of the day that we also just don't really believe anymore, like, till death do us part. The story Kathy read about Jesus preaching in the synagogue, well, he surely knows it's not easy being right, and some things are just hard to hear. Some quick backstory to this moment so it makes more sense. It comes on the heels of Jesus being baptized and then he's wandering for 40 days in the wilderness. He's being tempted, you know, man does not live by bread alone. And he returns home, local boy made good. And that's when we join him. And he reads from the Torah about Isaiah's prophecy of the Messiah coming to save the world. Well, that goes over fine. It even seems fine with everyone when he tells them that by his presence before them that day, that ancient prophecy has been fulfilled. Well, he's taking on quite a mantle. And the crowd loves him. They're amazed at the gracious words that come from his mouth. What takes them off, where he loses them, what really upsets them to no end, is when he mentions two people, two unlikely recipients of God's love. The first one is this widow of Zarephath. In the book 1 Kings, the evil king Ahab wants to kill the prophet Elijah, and God says to Elijah to seek out a widow with a small son who will feed them. And when he meets this widow, she's in the process of using the remnants of her flour and oil to make a small final meal for herself and her son. Widows at that time had absolutely no protection, and it was impossible for them to provide for themselves. And it was during this time of drought and famine that this poor widow expected that she and her son were going to starve to death after this small last meal that she was preparing. And so along comes Elijah, and he, he tells this hungry and desperate woman that she must take him in 
and care for him. And she thinks he's crazy because she's using her very last scraps of food to make this meager final meal for herself and her son. But Elijah says, God will provide for us. And sure enough, her flour and her oil are miraculously replenished throughout years of suffering throughout the land. They survive, and she is able to feed and house all of them. That is Zarephath's widow from Sidon. And the second person he mentions is from 2 Kings, a Syrian guy named Naaman, who was a masterful colonel and who was afflicted with leprosy. Naaman eventually humbles himself before God and he follows the word of the prophet Elisha, who says, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and God will cleanse you. And he does, and God cleanses him, freeing Naaman from his leprosy. Okay, now cut back to Jesus' teaching. He's with his crowd of admirers, and he says no prophet is accepted in their hometown. And then he invokes these two people, this poor widow and her son, and this leprous colonel. And this incites the crowd. They go crazy. They're filled with rage. It's like rush hour on the 405 in L.A. People are screaming. Someone's just cut in front of you, and you want revenge. They're so mad, they want to throw him off the cliff. Why? Why would they freak out like this? These are two wonderful stories of miracles. These desperate people saved from starvation and disease. The shock for this crowd, the outrage, comes from the fact that these two are Gentiles. And Jesus says, hey, there were lots of Jewish widows in need, but Elijah was sent to Zarephath's widow, a Gentile. And there were lots of people with leprosy, but the only one cleansed was this awful Syrian Gentile. Jesus is saying to them, God didn't save us, our widows and lepers, God saved a poor pagan widow and cleansed an arrogant pagan colonel that we don't care about. God didn't save us. God saved these two worthless Gentiles. And when people heard this, they were incensed because they were doing everything right. And they expected to receive God's grace, and it should work that way. Yet Jesus says, hey, I know you think you're the chosen one, but God's extending her grace to someone who hasn't done anything right. It's like the undeserving is being lifted up before those who are more deserving. It's like the prodigal son. I'm sure we all remember the, the one brother stays at home and works the fields, asks for no special favors from his father. He's respectful, hardworking, always does what he's told. And then his brother, who insulted his father by asking for his inheritance early, abandons the family, goes off, squanders all his money on his own pleasure. This no good Nick has the nerve to come back, begging his father just to hire him as a lonely farmhand. Well, maybe the older brother could have tolerated that moderate level of mercy. But what does that do? Kill the fatted calf. Bring a fancy robe. Get out all the trimmings. We're going to have a big celebration. We're going to party like it's 99. <laughs> well, the responsible brother is raging. Hey, I do everything I'm supposed to do. And you've never done anything like this for me. And the father says, we have to celebrate. Your brother was lost and now is found. And grace is like that. It's offered to all, the poor and the rich, the good and the bad, the sinner and the righteous, the responsible and the slacker, the hard worker and the footloose and fancy free. It's offered to all. Well, that's not what people want to hear. Why should I do what's right if God's going to love that good for nothing who does everything wrong? It's not right. They don't deserve it. Well, that adoring crowd turned on Jesus pretty quickly. They didn't 
really want to hear about God's grace. Not all of it. They wanted to hear about the part they agreed with. They wanted to hear the part that made them feel good. They were going to receive a Messiah who would save them. They wanted to hear the part that made them feel like maybe they were just a little bit better than everybody else. You know, Jesus could have sent the crowd away singing his praises and letting them go home and urge, you know, let them urge all their friends to come next Saturday. Come here, Joseph's son. He's a great preacher. Could he have left well enough alone? He couldn't just share half the story, the part of the story everyone loved hearing. No. He had to tell it all. God doesn't call us to tell half the truth. God doesn't call us to live half the truth. God doesn't call us to love half the people. And Jesus felt he had to share all the good news that God loves everyone. Everyone. Like my sister, Jesus knew it wasn't always enjoyable being right. It's not always easy to tell the truth. It's not always easy to hear the truth. There's a story in this big book about Jeremiah, a young boy, who God calls to be a prophet, and he famously says, Hey God, I can't speak for you. I am just a young boy. And God says, don't say I'm only a boy. I will give you the words to speak. And in the story it says, and with that, God put his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth and said to him, now I have put my words in your mouth. The common translation, I'm sure if we looked it up in this Bible, would say that God touches his mouth. But does that sound, and that sounds very sweet and all. But the Hebrew word is more often translated in other places as strikes, not touches. God strikes his mouth. And sometimes when we hear this kind of truth, we may feel like it strikes us, shakes us to our core. When we hear that God loves all people, it can shake or strike us at our comfortable sensibilities. You couldn't possibly mean him. You can't include her. They're not the right people. They're not good. They're not good enough. They're not clean enough. They're not law-abiding. They're not employed. They're not employable. They have horrible politics. They're not our people. They're Syrians like the leper colonel. They're Lebanese like the widow inside. They didn't want to hear that these people they didn't like or respect were as welcome as themselves, as loved as they were. And that's such a big part of the teaching that probably got Jesus in so much hot water. I've often quoted the wonderful words of the writer Anne Lamott who said, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> Over and over again, we hear that same old Jesus message, that same old Bible message that can be so hard for us to hear. Whenever we think someone doesn't belong, that they're, a, that they're unworthy and they deserve to be excluded, Jesus brings them in. He sits with them. He eats with these people. He promises them the kingdom as much as he does to anyone else. There's a great theologian named Fred Craddock who says Jesus doesn't go elsewhere because he's rejected. He's rejected because he goes elsewhere. He goes towards full inclusion. He goes towards a, a truth, a love that was written for anyone who would listen. Now here's something that might be hard for us to hear. Who's not here? Who's missing from our table, from our pews? Who have we not welcomed by accident or by design? There was a time in the Presbyterian Church when some of its white members could not hear that God loved African Americans as much as white people, and they left this church over slavery. And there was a time in this church when some of its male members 
could not hear that God called women as elders and preachers, and they left this church over the ordination of women. And there was a time in this church when some of its straight members could not hear that God welcomed gays and lesbians, and they left this church over the full inclusion of the LGBTQ community. The church is smaller. Its heart is bigger. Paul writes, Faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love. We even have a sign that says love. It's not out here today. We love our sign that says love. It's maybe even... Uh, Maybe more than our signs that say hope or faith or peace. And we love when the SPC solstice illuminates that sign, <laughs> that sign that says love with pure bright sunlight, right when I'm talking. And you know, I'm usually talking about love. And so the question that may be hard to hear for us is whom do we not love? Can we ask ourselves, that question, can we answer it? Can we then take an opportunity to learn to love? Last summer, I went to a friend's uh, Catholic parish, and they had a new priest. First time the priest was meeting the congregation. And he said this wonderful thing. He said, a lot of us, we're just going to love on each other. We're just going to just take to each other like a duck to water. I'm going to love you and you're going to love me and it's just going to be so easy and great. And he says, some of you are going to teach me to love. He said, I'm not saying you're hard to love. You'll teach me to love. Because it won't just flow naturally. I'll have to learn what it is. I'll have to reach for it and try it. I don't know if anybody here might feel at all annoyed or angry or bored at this point, but boy, that would mean that we can really understand the radical message of this ancient prophet. Because those kinds of feelings would be a great lead-in to Lent and Easter to understand why his friends in the synagogue were so mad at him. And it would help us more deeply understand how a sweet, kind guy who just seemed to talk about love and compassion could stir up so much needed tension. And the more we go into these challenging places, the more we'll be able to hear that love is patient. The more we'll be able to learn that love is kind. The more we'll understand that love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. We will come to understand that it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It carries all things. It carries us through our joy and through our sorrows, through our well-being and through our illnesses. It believes all things are possible it hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three. And the greatest of these is love. Will you please pray with me? Beloved God, oh, strike us down. Strike us around. Lift us up somehow. There are places we are human, you know that, that's how you created us, and we struggle with this idea of love, which is so beautiful and inspiring, and is the subject of so many songs we love to sing. And yet, if we're honest, it's hard. be really hard even with people we really love deeply. It can be hard to love them. Those with whom we have put ourselves side by side, shoulder to shoulder to go through life. And so how much easier 
it is to not love the stranger, the different person, the less than person. So help us to find this love that is patient and kind. Help us to learn to love, to see who's not here, to welcome the outcast, the easily hateable. Amen. So, uh, we have our tradition of the dialogue, and that's where we get to all jump in on this. So, if anyone wants to...